design's always been about control, about controlling the environment, about controlling populations, about controlling how people react to dominant regimes or architectural styles. From the beginning of time, powerful people have fought to control how we communicate and the environment in which we live. But it's almost like architecture and design bring about the props and backdrops against which we dramatise our lives. In 1985, when we set Grooven Images up, there was no one else in Scotland working across disciplines. And we very much wanted to see if we could have a company that was based in this cross-disciplinary way of working. We've got architects, interior designers, graphic designers, people who also lead double lives as musicians or filmmakers, or they're interested in lots of different things. The work that we do covers all of that spectrum of activity from international travelling exhibitions to interior architectural work to uh, corporate identity, branding, graphic design work and more and more I think we're moving towards developing new brands on behalf of ourselves and other clients. This is a restaurant which we designed called Favourite. It's a bit like one of those places that have always been there. It's, it's a cafe but it's also a bar, it's a coffee shop, it's a a deli, I mean you can go there and get some pasta sauce and take it home and heat it up or you can sit down and eat the pasta in situ and the secret of this is a, a venue is it's a place where people won't just go once a month or once a week, it's a place where people might go two or three times a day. This is a restaurant in Glasgow called Tun Tun. It uses quite hard finishes, there's a lot of tile and there's a lot of real stone and the overall feel is perhaps a little bit sexies. We've got these great um, chairs, these big round uh, white leather tub chairs and it has something off, uh, off the feel of Barbarella, perhaps. The next um, project in here is a coffee shop called Tinderbox, which is in the west end of Glasgow. And um, the thing that was, was interesting from our point of view about, about this project was to try and make a place where people were going to feel a bit more relaxed, somewhere that you could spend two or three hours rather than just 15 minutes. So it's got more in common with a typical bar, a traditional pub, than it has with a retail outlet. I think designers do have at their fingertips an armory of methodological, analytical tools, methodologies, um, things that allow them to approach a situation almost like a, an archaeologist, but a social archaeologist as well as somebody working with tangible things that you can touch and feel and see. I think a willingness just to listen, to be able to ask the right questions and to listen and to be able to draw out what the fundamental and dynamic aspects are of any situation because the one thing you can be sure of, that there are no two projects that are ever going to be the same. The ideal project is one which involves all of the disciplines, which involves two dimensions and three dimensions, which involves architectural space, and also which involves a sensitivity to the existing context. And I think there are many mistakes that have been made, um, especially in the design of bars, where people try and create something which is a, a template, you know, on the basis of a very rigid template. And that, that loses huge opportunities to do something which responds to the specific environment. This is a Tinderbox site that we did two years ago and we're now going to take the whole brand and the whole idea down to London and Islington and uh, Upper Street and uh, what we're going to do, well, the reason I'm going today is basically just going to try and decide on what materials and what kind of elements have been successful on this site and uh, which ones we're going to retain and which ones we're going to um, improve on. What we've done is we've brought all our materials together from the first tinderbox site, this site, and uh, what we thought was which materials out of all this palette um, would someone say, so if you ask any of these guys here what they'd associate with tinderbox, I think the main one would be the stainless steel and probably a lot of the coloured red glass. And these are all quite hard materials and I think part of the success of these is that we've used a lot of timber to soften it, so just to make that kind of more comfort feel. In terms of the, the frontage, Kirsty, is the way that we're going to manage to raise the profile of a store from the outside against all the other shops that are already there? I think so. I think um, 
I think we have to introduce like a three-dimensional sign that sits out. So the whole view that you've got going along Upper Street, you know, has got your CJ sign sitting out, and it's quite strong. And um, I think the what's really successful here with the stainless steel frame to the window. I think we've got that exactly that we'll have this frame with. A good day's work in this part of the world is still regarded as something which you have something to to show for it. And I think whilst we're learning about service industries, there's still a great deal of um, value placed on the act of making something. When we originally graduated and decided that we would have our own studio where we could produce our fabrics, we were constantly being confronted by the kind of textiles that we would never ever have. You know, you would never want to have them for your house, so our, our idea was to in, indulge ourselves and say, well, this is what we would really like for, for our place. So, Yara and I kind of re try to revamp the whole idea that people would look at textiles, especially interior textiles. Yeah, it's trying try to make things more interesting as well, you know. Um, I think that's what sort of drives us, really, is, is really, you know, you look at the market and, and um, it's really about what isn't there rather than what is there. And that's where we try and design in, in those gaps. And there's loads of them. We go from the design, you know, from the purely the, the pen and ink drawing through right through to the production of the screens, through to the final printed printed piece. I mean these start off with um, like the drawing for an image that obviously this is then scanned at the computer, produced out on the, the film work which we then expose on the screens here. This is then, you know, taken onto the sort of test tables, but then producing maybe all the sort of different colourways before we actually go to the final print run. The traditional designs that we do, um, you know, we change the scale, we put images that are quite unusual. I mean, this is a very traditional design of a thistle, but the scale that's massive is about a metre and a half across or something. But over the years, what we realised was that people were pigeonholing our style of work or our business in this very traditional, very sort of classic, albeit kind of unusual because of the, the sort of scales, etc. But what we decided to kind of well consciously do was to promote a side of ourselves which was more kind of contemporary or to be seen as to be more modern, more contemporary. So we started developing uh, a range of designs that were based on um, kind of everyday things, you know, like weather maps, for example, and um, circuit boards. We were approached by the client who gave us the full run to actually produce the floor coverings and wall coverings down to the light fittings and we worked with another company one foot taller so you have their remit which is product design and ours which is surface pattern. We had some upholstery fabric but basically the only surface decoration was these laminates. I mean this material is quite unusual in that it can be put over curved surfaces and it also comes in a transparent form as well. But what was interesting about it was that it was being used in a very dull way. Um, it was, I mean, it was actually for exterior signage, so it had very good sort of durability. And also we developed the idea that we could have it clear, so that rather than just covering over a cheap material, you could actually cover over something um, you know, which itself is a good quality, um, let's say a birch uh, ply or something. You still see the wood coming through, you have this graphic quality to it, and it becomes part of the furniture. It opened up a whole new area for us in surface decoration. We started off by producing products because we we had to prove that we were able to produce products and were able to have mar things which were successful on the market. We never had much money to put into tooling and stuff, so we um, relied on manufacturers' goodwill, really. Uh, it's an ashtray that we did for one person. We started deciding to do more and more complicated things. There's, there's a clock that we did, again using sand casting, which is really simple. And it, there's only one piece of casting here. The rest is just held together by these um, uh, rubber O-rings. That eventually led on to a, kind of a, a good break, which was uh, doing a chair. This is the first one we did, um, and it's made of polyethylene, which is a bit like nylon. Uh, in a process called rotational moulding. It's a really simple technique. It's like putting something in the oven and turning it around. Because it's so simple, it's difficult to make kind of spiky shapes, it's difficult to make chairs. So we thought, how, how can we get around that, have something that's cheap to invest in, but still an elegant chair? It 
comes out of the of the machine as a single sort of balloon shape and then it's cut down this line and then we swap over the pieces bolt them together and you get a chair that's got four legs rather than a thing with two We were worried that with the smaller chair that we would be competing against injection moulded chairs, although it's a nice idea. We felt that if we did an armchair, which there aren't any really in the, in the, in the same competition, um, we would kind of get a bit of the market we wouldn't have before. We make up this solid shape out of wood. Sounds a bit messy now, but so you make your form glue up lots of bits of plywood and then carve it basically and we use the thing that's a bit like a chainsaw so um, it's very untechnical and, and quite hands-on so we carved this huge piece of wood and we had rods sticking right through this and that piece there so we'd have them together like this some of the time and then swap them over to make sure that the the edges all went to the same place. It was just like hands-on sculpture chair. The first piece of design we did was with one foot tall and a project called the Chasm Chair. There hasn't been a decent chair from Scotland that isn't Macintosh uh, that we can think of. Um, and that was the starting point of the brief. And, you know, sort of the rest is history because it's just gone so fast that the, the, the image of the design has travelled to every corner of the world. With the adventure that we've had in the design, we're getting more and more interior designers or specifiers mm. thinking about the chair in relation to the overall scheme of design. So I think that's not helped us in terms of getting sales now, mm -hmm. but it will eventually show that we do have a worldwide distributable product yeah. by the time that really sinks in across. The design scene's been growing over the past few years and what it really needs is a network, you know, that's how the creative industries sustain themselves. The Lighthouse is a conversion of Charles Ray Macintosh's um, 1895 building he did for the Glasgow Herald and it was derelict for about 15 years until Glasgow became UK City of Architecture and Design and it was decided to turn it into an architecture and design centre. It's a conversion of a former warehouse, so we've got lots of flexible space from big, medium to small. So we have a whole range of exhibitions, and young designers and young architects are now getting their chance and they can stay in Glasgow and they can become successful. The interesting thing about the lighthouse is that it covers so many different disciplines. It's got a very broad cultural and industrial remit. It's actually interested in examining the process of, of designing and creating and taking an active role in influencing that process and learning about it as well as just sticking things in pedestals and glass cases. We had an opportunity to work with the Glasgow Collection three times. I think Glasgow is very keen to build a design culture. We've been asked to work with a manufacturer coming up with new products for that. The Glasgow Collection studio. was one of the major projects within the Year of Architecture and Design 1999. It focused entirely on product design and product development to try and nurture some of the, the ideas that were not getting to industry. It's attempting to put in touch good ideas coming from students and manufacturers and create new products and new ideas. We were asked to look at this particular material and to find new applications for it. This is a recycled polyethylene and it's basically made from agricultural waste. It's kind of sheets that farmers grow crops under and once they've done, once they've harvested, harvested their potatoes, they basically throw it away. And when we first started messing around with this material, we realized that it's got this sort of inherent bendiness. Um, which they've been trying to design out for years. They've been trying to engineer it um, so that it would be stiffer. And we as designers, of course, saw there was an opportunity to actually use this particular characteristic. Um, so we came up with an infinitely extendable system of exterior public seating. Basically, it works with eight pieces of the recycled polythene, which are set into these channels in an aluminium casting, which can have an optional back. So 
If we bring in the plastic again, you can see a straight, almost straight plastic beam, which then you can bend into the radius that you require, screw it in place along with the other legs, and repeat that until all the slots are full. One of the most important things about the Glasgow Collection is to allow young ideas, young companies to work with mature companies in the area to get ideas from the drawing board and into reality. And this is a perfect example, the Chasm Chair. It's an all-plastic chair, rotationally moulded. It's an international award winner. It uh, is already commercially very successful and is uh, uh, competing uh, internationally. And that's allowed a local retailer to have the control of a chair which he can sell completely internationally. Next to that then is the Canyon chair. Now this is really the big brother of this chair. It was designed for reception area, that type of seating. But here they're playing uh, games and colorways with uh, the, the inside. So they've got light here, dark on the outside. You could have bulk material maybe recycled and you could have virgin material or perhaps more expensive material here. So there's a whole range of things you can do here with this range of furniture. Um, on then to this Hoover, uh, this is work with the famous Hoover company and here they're working with IDEO in Palo Alto. The intention there was so that we got Hoover to do something a bit different from the, from the normal uh, run-of-the-mill thing. So we didn't just help them with their uh, standard product design, we actually helped them diversify into a new area completely. Another project that we looked at was a new type of canal barge. This is an investigation into new technologies, new ways of living, new ways of construction of canal barges, suitable for the new canal that will open up between Edinburgh and Glasgow. Here is a fully working uh, prototype of a contemporary look at bottled gas heaters. Now this is using standard technologies, standard materials, but it's just putting a contemporary look on a product that we all know and we're very tired of, to be honest. Going on from there then is here's the work of uh, Timorous Beasties. Now this, is, this represents Timorous Beasties, textile designers, working with a furniture designer and also working with a major furniture manufacturer to produce this range of furniture which is simple but it takes the application of the laminates very well. So it means that you can change the range of furniture very quickly, but very, very effectively and flexibly. This product is the work of uh, an undergraduate uh, designer who was also a drummer. And he developed the idea of an, an electronic digital hand drum. Now this drum plays like a normal drum. So we've not limited his ability to play the drum. But what we've done is we've opened up the whole access of digital. So you can tune the head to different sounds. It's truly MIDI compatible. Uh, you can tune these, all of these other parts of the drum to actually not just be a drum, but be an interface for digital music systems, which is much bigger than a drum ever was. The building dates from the turn of the century. Um, the arches effectively support the platforms as part of the infrastructure of Central Station. The building was first used culturally in 1990 when it was converted from a disused police compound to become the, the venue for the exhibition Glasgow's Glasgow. The trouble was that the building was done at a temporary nature and the long-term use of the building wasn't being catered for. So the idea was to revamp the building, look at the image of it, particularly to do with the entrance. Hi sir. Hello. We're currently working with One Foot Taller and Timorous Beasties, primarily to do with the box office, the entrance of Margoyle Street and the bar space. It's quite stimulating to work with new, fresh minds coming into the project. Having been involved in it for five years, uh, pushing the thing along slowly, it's nice to get some fresh input at this stage.
Well, you know, beside the stairs, we've got this yeah. huge kind of chain curtain, and we're just a wee bit worried about the size and scale of the chain. Because I thought you said last time that you wanted the chain to end up being bigger, because yeah. otherwise it wasn't going to... It's not that strong. Gonna, we're going to use this stuff here, but this is more expensive because it's brass with crown plated on it. It's quite hard to see because it's so huge, because it's going to go right on top of the ceiling all the way down into yeah. the second level. Um, so I think the actual scale of it can go bigger because you're seeing it at a more sort of distance than you. I think Scotland's a very vibrant place as far as the design industries go. It's also a culture that doesn't tolerate bullshit, which tends to be a big part of our industry. And it's nice to be challenged all the time because I think in order to be a successful designer, you have to challenge your own assumptions continually. This is our usual after work haunt, and uh, we like coming here because it's not a designer bar. In my opinion, a good bar is a good bar is a good bar. It doesn't, it doesn't matter whether it uses the latest contemporary materials or whether it, um, whether it uses the latest video technology or whether it, it uses um, the, the latest trendy graphics. I mean, it's ultimately the same thing. So this pub, which is a really good traditional bar, has got more in common with the very best contemporary designs than it has with the very worst of the, the things that the breweries roll out time and time again. It's, it's a kind of poor excuse for how people should be drinking. Sketching is the most important part of designing because it's the most direct way of communicating. I think that computer modelling is somehow misleading because you're looking at a 3D representation but it's still a two-dimensional image. At the same time, I suppose, as making the scale drawing on the drawing board, I'll be making a model of some kind, either cardboard or something, or this blue foam, which is really useful for for upholstery particularly, because um, I, can, I can make something like that, which is the two cushions and a base for this sofa. Um, I can make that in you know, five minutes, really. Because this system in particular has lots of bits that fit together in lots of ways, I also use these just cardboard templates to show how the thing fits together in plan. So this is looking straight down on, onto that, so I can see the kind of shapes that you can get. That's the start of the concept, that's the grid. The outer ring of that represents either arm or backrest. I cut out of that each piece, so that, that sofa Comes from, comes from that section of the grid. And then that is developed on to produce all these lots of different pieces and configurations. If you went by just what the media tell you, designers are responsible for one-off, high-cost, low-volume products. Whereas true design is in the design and manufacture of mass-produced things for everybody to use. Because when you wake up in the morning, all the way through to when you go to bed at night, you're using products all the time. And they have to be designed 
to be functional, desirable, they have to be um, conscious of the environment, they have to be affordable, they have to definitely work and be reliable. So all these things means that designers are responsible for so many other things apart from just straight aesthetics. This is the um, world famous wind-up radio, which of course works very simply. By winding this handle, you generate enough power to drive the radio inside. So completely human powered. But interesting in that in barely two years, uh, in this case Sony have come up with a, a version which works the same way. You wind up, it, genera it generates power, switch it on, you have a radio. But the fact is this is less expensive and, and, and an eighth of the weight and the, and the bulk, which is, shows how quickly things develop. This is a different type of product altogether. This is some packaging for a very expensive diamond, the Millennium Diamond from De Beers, which is a limited edition three carat diamond. So we have a 20,000 pound diamond here, which had to be packaged in a way which reflected its value to the consumer. The buyers of these expect a certain quality, but this has to surpass that perception of quality. We had to go to Venice to find the Italians who could cast this in aluminium. We had to go all the way to Hong Kong to find a manufacturer who could make this box, which is leather covered, with the same qualities. A true international product, designed in the UK, from South Africa, made in Italy and Hong Kong. Perfect. Snowboards, again a different market altogether. These are designed for the Japanese market where there are more boarders than there are skiers. It's very important in this case, as with all projects, to actually understand your consumer. In this case, um, snowboarding is one of those um, cultures, one of those pastimes which has its own culture and um, a very particular attitude towards not just snowboarding, not just ski uh, falling down a mountain, but uh, a kind of lifestyle thing. So the graphics on this reflect that type of approach. And of course, very important for the designer to experience snowboarding, so basically I can snowboard now, which is an added benefit. Moving along to this product, this is a, um, a wheel designed for PlayStation, particularly driving games like Gran Turismo. It's designed to be, to, to be used like an F1 wheel, Formula One wheel, where you have gear change, paddles behind the wheel, here and here. We have ergonomically laid out buttons for gear changes and directions and so on. And we have rubber grips, we have a flattened top of the wheel like you get on Formula One. And so a lot of research went into this in the, in the sense of taking out a Formula Ford car, which is not too far away from Formula One, to really get a feel of gameplay from a real point of view, jumping in a car and using a, a steering wheel. Already, unfortunately, if you look at F1 wheels in the year 2000, this is designed in 1998. The wheel has changed again. It's bigger, has more function. There's LEDs on the top. Kodak is arguably the world's leading photographic brand, but less known for cameras these days. And we were asked to create a new line of cameras for Kodak. And rather than do Me Too products, to leapfrog the competition, say, well, OK, that's what the competitors are doing. Um, but what should Kodak be doing? Kodak is a leading brand, it shouldn't be copying. And that's very much yeah. our message with brands, is have your own strong and, personality. Uh, this was the final model that was shown at the, at the research groups. Right, now this isn't, this isn't the final production, is it? This is what you call P1, right? Which is like mm. an, early, an early production model. Yeah, and what we found is that people really um, much prefer this um, flash situation mm. where we've got mm. the cover of the flash mm -hmm. um, protecting the lens and then mm -hmm. opening up. You know, the, the whole idea of the APS magic, you know, the idea that this is APS film, not regular 35mm film, and, the, and, and that we want to get that across so that when you see it in the store, you, you know, consumers can instantly identify as an APS camera and see that that's a positive thing. Um, did, did that come across? Did people read that? Did they see that? They certainly picked up that this was, yeah. a, this was a different um, type of camera. Yeah. Um, I mean, they understood the benefits of the, of the APS system, mm -hmm. the drop load and mm -hmm. the format selection. Yeah. Because it's so, so many times on, on the products, it's really hidden yeah. on competitors' products. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, I think it, it really did. I think we've managed to create a new look and feel for consumer cameras. It's quite different from what's out there on the shelves. And we want people to go into, um, into a photographic store and look at that sort of 
row of little silver boxes on the shelf and then see this other thing here and say, well, what's that? You know, that looks different, that looks exciting, and that's the Kodak camera, and that's what we, that's what we want to do. I originally met a washing machine repairman back in 1993 who had some different ideas on how washing machines were made and he said um, all washing machines are the same which got me very interested because you go in the shops and they all look the same, they all got a little round porthole and so that got me very interested in the whole idea of washing machines and so we worked on it for um, about five years and it was at that point that we decided we should have some design input and bring in people like TKO to actually get the whole thing from a concept, which it very much was, into a reality which is a product. The best thing about this project from our point of view is that we've been involved right from the beginning, which is quite rare. We, we literally met Martin with a box of, of bits um, and lots of aspirations for how the, the project should go and what the machine should be like. What we were responsible for was the, the product design. It's taking his idea and actually making it into something tangible. We had to bring in people who were experts. For instance, we used a company called Cock and Hen who are engineers and prototype makers. This was our actual starting point for the washing machine project. Um, it's a, a proof of concept rig, which I know looks pretty crude, but I mean, what this did is it proved the principle of an angled drum. Uh, it proved the principle of, of, of circulating water throughout the drum itself. And I mean, even this rig, I mean, it heated the water. You could actually wash clothes in it. Uh, so that was the principle proved. Uh, our job was to take this principle take this construction, so to speak, and get it into a standard cabinet size, which is 600 by 600, so it fits under everyone's kitchen worktop, which the majority of European machines do. Uh, that in itself presented problems, as you can see, the size of this, shrinking it down. Yes. This, this basic unit didn't really, it didn't have a basket in it, but it basically showed the principle of showering the clothes. This, our basket works like a shower system. So this was done just to, to see if we can get the basic wash test and pass the, the, the requirements. It also had a, a basic suspension system, although there again it was quite cruised, but something for us to, to start on and then develop rip further rigs from this. We then produced models not similar to this. I mean, this is the part that holds the drum, the main sort of chassis of the machine. Uh, but through these card models, we could then sort of build up a very fast instruction using foam card to actually see what the, what the general, general configuration within the box would be. Uh, we then went from these types of models to hand fabricated part components like this. So we were immediately uh, able to assemble these, put it together in, 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 into, into a framework and actually do some wash tests, some suspension tests, vibration tests. So the progress really was, was, was quite, quite speedy. And down here we've got a basic test rig that fits into a standard sized cabinet that fits underneath a European work surface height and it basically shows how little room there is here for things to move around. Right. It's used really for testing the wash quality and for the energy consumption and uh, testing different components out on the machine. This is actually quite, a, quite an old rig we have. It's also given us the facility to look at components in more detail in the situation they'll actually be in. Uh, like the door for example, because you can see that this huge door, far bigger than any conventional washing machine on the market at the moment, which in itself gives us problems. I mean, if you get a young child who's going to grab onto the top and swing it, you've got to really build some strength into it. And initially, we were looking at a plastic moulded door, which would be nice and light and, you know, very economical. Uh, but we've ended up with a casting. But that in itself, that decision has brought a quality to the machine. It's like the Mercedes car door. As it closes, you get a good weighty clunk. Uh, so it's details like this that we're looking at and have developed through rigs like this that are giving the machine quality. And if we can, we can actually give it a go, get a basket, basket out of here. here. This is a hand fabricated basket that we've made here. Uh, it's in the correct material, which is polypropylene, which will withstand the 90 degree wash temperatures. And we've built in a rudimentary sprinkler system into the basket. Uh, in fact, we can put some washing in this and yep. see how it goes. What you do is you throw your washing in and put it straight into the drum. And in reality, the door would have to close before the machine can be turned on, but with this, we've uh, rigged up the electronics so we can just show you it working. Then I just turn it on there. That's the water going in now. The basket presented particular problems. It has to do lots of quite clever things in terms of getting the sprinkle system of water in and out of the basket. It has to stay fixed in the drum, press itself to the side when it's, when it's spinning, be able to um, lift in and out really easily. 
have a sort of entry portal which doesn't restrict your space too much. A lot of problems we had initially was trying to get water to the front of the machine. The problem with a 20 degree angle drum is that the water would generally just, if it was full of water and worked like a conventional machine, which is basically a bathtub, all the water would sit at the back of the machine and then you find that when you've got a full load, clothes at the front of the machine don't actually get wet. Now by using the shower system, we basically managed to get the clothes very wet all evenly all, all around. We looked at what other washing machine manufacturers in this price bracket were doing and traditionally some of the big German manufacturers are offering anything up to 50 programs, which if you talk to any consumer they'll say, I use about two, I probably one for my colours, one for whites. So we pared it down to the absolute minimum that we thought was necessary in terms of consumer expectation at that price point. So you've got all just the basic wash programs and a very easy push button programming mechanism. This is a, 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 a prototype that we've totally hand fabricated, made in house, which you can now see all the details coming together. I think it's going to be very exciting when we see this in the shops and you see how different it is to conventional machines which are basically sold on price alone because they all look very, very similar. So it's going to be a, a quite a revolution, I think. At this point, we're really product and interaction design and um, traditionally people have drawn a line down the middle and said, okay, uh, you know, this thing here, this is a product, this, this thing that I operate with, that's interaction. We do websites, you know, we do things that just exist there purely digitally. We do furniture, we do pens, things that exist purely physically. But where, as a group, our hearts really lie is, is in this um, overlap um, in that area where things can really, really mingle. One of the projects we're working on right now is um, with the Science Museum in London who are um, uh, opening a new building called the Welcome Wing this year. It's mainly an interactive museum about digital technology and biomedicine. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Reach further, 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 the idea is to be able to access that part of the brain without the user being aware that you're doing that. If you have a look inside the Teratron box itself, you can actually see that there are five sensors spaced around the body of it. If you actually break the beam in the sensor, and the computer reads that which one will correlate to pictures of electrical wiring. You know, we've got an air pump which is um, actually making these little um, maggots wobble up here when people put their hands in. The minute you do your first prototype and step back and let somebody try it out, you're just immediately struck with, oh God, you know, I should have thought of that, and oh yeah, right, you know. But you don't think of those things when you're working on it, you know, on your, on your desktop. It's getting another person in front of it that it always brings it to the fore. The great thing about working with um, museum interaction is that, um, you know, each exhibit really is a one-off prototype and it enables you to experiment and really look at state-of-the-art ways of doing things that we know we'll be able to apply in more commercial work. Every year the organisers of the Ideal Home Exhibition have a sort of house of the future and this year the organisers invited a number of product design firms to contribute products of the future. So we thought it would be fun to do the home office for the year 2020. This is what was the home computer. We wanted to make it look and feel more like a piece of furniture, and that's why it's called the view table. It's just in the corner of the room, and any time you need to do any of those things, you know, whether it's working, shopping, talking, you just go up to it, probably snap your fingers or something. It's always switched on, it's always online. You can pretty much second guess what might happen in the future. You know, screens are getting thinner, have become thinner. Um, speaker technology is changing. Um, voice recognition software does exist. Irish recognition software exists. Fingerprint software exists. I'm actually on record as saying that I don't think that technology and furniture should be connected because technology products generally have a lifespan of two or three years, whereas furniture products have a lifespan of 10 or 15 or more years. But we felt that in this case we wanted to make this sort of like strong statement that the computer has ceased to be 
really uh, by 2020 it ceased to be a machine and it's as much a part of your life as the windows in your house. However you look at it, everybody knows the future is digital. You don't care if it's a digital cash machine, digital passport, TV, radio. It's all going that way. And in that case, you listen to some people and it might all come down to one medium. It might all converge. Or it might all split out again. You don't know. And to be honest, you don't really care. As long as you accept change and you run towards it rather than from it, then the future will always be digital. I don't care if one day I'm designing a soundtrack for a pop promo or whether it's a piece of video art or, or a website. Multimedia is that multiple discipline mix. We're five and a half, which in terms of new media, we are the granddaddies. We are the ZZ Top of new media. So uh, you know, we come into meetings and people think we're tired and give us a chair, which does seem strange because the oldest person in here isn't over 35. The average age is 24. We have one T-shirt that we all wear, and that is design is communication. Technology is merely transportation of the idea. So don't concentrate on the transport bit. Make sure the design, the communication is right. The Design Museum celebrates its 10th anniversary this year and uh, they asked us to design a, a very visual, quite striking site, not text heavy, to really give a taster of the Design Museum but not give it away. Yeah, not to give it away. That was the unwritten rule. It was that romance before the kiss that they needed. It was that glimpse of thigh that would encourage you along to the museum rather than just seeing it all at once. The cube was a starting point for us so that's one of the intro animations which gives a brief preview of that concept. The browser itself is square so it's one face of a cube so you can go down to different pages. It's like literally turning a cube around. It's being used throughout the site as a, as a navigational sort of metaphor. Again, actually coming from the concept of the cube was a virtual gallery online. Again, user following the same idea of not giving it all away but just giving a teaser. And as you launch the gallery it opens up these six windows which contain some piece of design and you would be able to click on the different windows and almost make up a different design piece and sometimes they are puzzles which don't fit together quite yet and you are sort of encouraged to actually find out okay what is this piece again it's it's about exciting and educating about design so piecing things together you almost learn about what what the shape is and you appreciate the details of the design Deep End itself does not have a house style. We don't have a brand, uh, we don't use the fonts we bought that week. We have an approach, which is to be very brand focused, to become champions to what people sometimes are asking, or in fact what they, they haven't even realized yet. And we're in a position where what we do forms culture, forms the way society deals with a personal email delivered to them in a very public space like their TV. Mm, it should be handled this way. If we dream it, it can happen. It'll be accepted. And at that point, you've got to be just very careful for what you dream. We got Psycho and Demon. We got Psycho from uh, Rolling Sixties Crips. We got uh, Junior from Ghetto Boys. As I'm looking, I'm starting to feel these real kind of uh, emotions choking up in me because there's probably about uh, 20 or 25 different uh, gang members that are carved in here. I'd say about a dozen of them, almost half of them are, are dead. Tomato is a conversation. And from that conversation we have ideas. And then we put those ideas into some sort of form, in some sort of space, um, form to exist. What we actually um, do is we kind of do, some people we, we kind of make bits of work. And those bits of work might end up being books. They might end up being on television. They might end up being commercials. So yeah, people have had kind of think problems with what we are. We still, we still refer to it as a design studio all the time. Um, yes, we do design. We also do film. It's visible, music. and that might attract people. We publish books. Um, but I think the thing that gives it direction, and I think it's a multiple direction all the time, you know, because people are pulling in different directions and doing their own things, um, is the, the desire to make things. sort of tend to think, uh, I don't tend to think of myself as a, a designer, but there are some aspects to the things I do that are designed um, uh, or refining or, or, you know, creating an essence um, from So therefore we don't have to term, term what we do as stuff down. fine um, art, design, graphics, it's just work.
I'm 27 just now and I started using hard drugs when I was 22. Like, can I do know everybody was using it? So, the wee shots, I didn't like that. We just wanted to try and, you know, convey the, the emotions we felt in what people were saying and our only emotional response to it. Um, is it animation? Is it a piece of film? Is it graphic design? I don't know. You know, the idea that um, design is all those, all the magazines that you sort of see in the rack, um, you know, I just is a kind of, it just doesn't interest me. I'd rather read National Geographic because you'll learn that, you know, um, you know, otters have produce a gene that kind of makes sure they're young, live longer, you know, things like that, I think, that are far more interesting. Two cars start 100 miles apart on a long, straight road at 5 p.m. One travels at 60 miles per hour, the other at 40. What time will they pass? There is extraordinary literacy in the world. Clever, isn't it? Advertising doesn't work in a Pavlovian way very often anymore had that in the 50s and for some reason people still think it works like that absolute nonsense people see an advert they say that's an advert it doesn't for one second mean that they're going to actually engage with the brand itself one of the things I've been doing for the last two and a half years is working with lab architecture studio um, in Melbourne on helping create the new cultural centre for Melbourne called Federation Square and they asked me to not only come in and do things like the signage system and whatever but actually interrogate what a signage system is so all the signage system is multilingual, it's electronic, LED based it's interactive as well um, therefore it's also programmable so it can be information but it also be knowledge and it can also be an artwork If we didn't travel, if everything took place here that, I think that would be a, a less rich sort of environment, a less rich experience. The fact that we all do travel and bring stuff back and do things in all sorts of different places makes for a, a sort of richer sort of input, if you like, or a richer kind of fabric. still perceived as a company that does wobbly type. Well, fair enough, we might still do that when we see it as a, being an appropriate response, as opposed to a design solution, because there are no solutions or questions uh, or problems. There's only situations and responses. Um, so yes, no, it is a problem, because for example, if you only just show commercials or our own personal work, um, or even like Federation Square, that's about 5% of what we do. So it is a problem because we're trusting you to tell the whole story. The whole story cannot be told. It's a conundrum. Design's always been about control 